uh, another copy to uh, Kufa in Iraq. So each of the provinces, they got one of the copies. And along with a copy, he sent one of the famous reciters of the Quran as well. So along with a physical copy of the Quran, he also sent a famous reciter with it. And then he made a general proclamation, a general announcement all over the Muslim Caliphate. And he said, anybody who has any copy of the Quran should dispose of it and come and copy the Quran from this original copy. Let nobody just copy an unofficial copy because you don't know where that copy came from. So he disposed of all of the Qur'ans. Now when you dispose of the Qur'an, we are not supposed to just throw it away in the trash or throw it away in the garbage. No, rather we're supposed to get rid of it in a way that nobody can disrespect it. So of the ways you can dispose of it, you can uh, dip it in, in, in water or in the ocean and the ink would dissolve. This is the old ink we're talking about. And of the ways that you can bury it in a deep, far away uh, place until it decomposes. Because remember, the earliest Qur'ans were written on leather or parchment which decomposes. And of the ways is that you can burn it, not as a sign of disrespect, but rather as a, as a protection of future disrespect. In other words, you get rid of it in a way that other people will not be able to disrespect it. And this is an important factor because when we say that the, the, the Qur'ans were burnt by the early Muslims, from the Western mentality, to burn a book generally speaking, is to show disrespect to it. But when you do this to the Qur'an, it is to make sure that nobody tramples on it or nobody throws it away. In other words, you get rid of it in a manner that will prevent its disrespect later on. Now, this was what was done, that all of the Qur'ans and all of the uh, mushafs of all of the ummah were then taken and disposed of, and anybody who wanted a Qur'an had to copy it directly from the Mus'haf of Uthman ibn Affan, and that is why we call it the Uthmanic Mus'haf. All future Qur'ans, even up to our times, conform letter for letter, word for word with the Qur'anic Mus'hafs. It was a drastic measure. But it was a necessary measure. And it is due to Uthman, it is due to the efforts of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved the Qur'an. To this day, there is no different version of the Qur'an. There is but one Qur'an. And this is due to the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he showered on Uthman ibn Affan. And this was done by the unanimous consensus of all of the companions at the time. Now, the Qur'ans at that time were written in a very ancient script. It is called Kufic script. And that script was not uh, having dots or vowels on it. The dots and the tashkils were added later on in the second and third centuries of the Hijrah. And this was done to facilitate the readings of the Qur'an. And it is narrated that the first person to add diacritical marks, i.e. what we call tashkil, the fatha kasra dhamma, the first person to do so was a person by the name of Abu al-Aswad al-Du'ali. And Abu al-Aswad al-Du'ali uh, was a person who lived uh, in the first century of the Hijrah and a student of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And he used to add dots in specific places to take the place of fatha kasra dhamma. So he would put a dot below the letter if it was a kasra, a dot above the letter if it was a fatha, and a dot after the letter if it was a dhamma. And later on, people began to differentiate between the various letters of the Arabic alphabet. The early script of the Arabic alphabet did not have dots on the letters. So a fa and a qaf could only be told apart by context. And a ba and a ta and a tha could only be told apart by context. And a ha and a kha could only be told apart by context. Later on, people developed a more sophisticated script. And so until our times, the most common script that we use is called the Neskhi script. Now I wanted to show you some of the earliest copies of the Qur'an that we have that are still present in our times. And of the copies of the Qur'an that we have, if we can see on the screen here, if you can look at the screen now, uh, it's coming on your screen, we have the copy of the Tashkent Mus'haf. Now this Mus'haf, the Tashkent Mus'haf, it is uh, one of the oldest Qur'ans ever preserved. And it is reputed to be one of the Uthmanic Mus'hafs. And it is re re preserved in uh, Tashkent, which is a province in modern-day Russia. And if we see over here, this is a closer copy of it. We find that this is not paper as we know it, but rather leather. And the leather or the vellum has been placed on papers for our times, but this is the original uh, script of the Uthmanic Mus'haf. We see here a facsimile or a photocopy version 
This is how it was written. And if you notice, it is almost impossible for us modern day readers to read this Quran simply because uh, the script has evolved. We need notice here over here uh, the Lafzul Jalala word Allah. We, here we have laha alaykum, for example. We notice certain words we can make out. Otherwise, generally speaking, it is very difficult to uh, see and read this type of mushaf because we are not used to seeing the script. Another uh, version that we have a close-up version of it, over here we see also a, 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 a manuscript copy of the Tashkent version, which is reputed to be the version of Uthman. And here again we can make out Waman, for example, over here. This is a noon, and there is no dot on it. And the reason is because there were no dots in the earliest uh, manuscripts. Another uh, early Mus'haf that we have is the Husseini Mus'haf, which is present in Cairo. And we notice this is also of the first century of the Hijrah, probably 40, 50 Hijrah written down. Look at how big it is. Why? Because this is real leather. It is not paper. It is leather. And it has been preserved uh, to this day. And this is a Mus'haf dating back to decades after the death of the Prophet wasallam, And these are the specialist curators that have been assigned to take care of it. To this day, this Mus'haf is present. We can see it and compare it letter for letter. Here is another Mus'haf that is found in Topkapi in Istanbul. And it is also a ver very early Mus'haf reported to be the Uthmanic Mus'haf. We see it closer uh, over here. And the dots we see have a very different structure than our own uh, dots. This too is the Topkapi Mus'haf. This is an example of a mushaf that was written around 80 or 90 hijrah and it is written in an early script in Yemen it is called al-ma'il and we can see it is a bit more easy for us but still quite difficult for us to understand uh, and the last one that I wanted to show you uh, or the second to last is this is the one that was commissioned by the famous Umayyad Caliph Al-Walid ibn Abdul Malik and he commissioned this mushaf to be written for him and this is the royal mushaf of the first century of the Hijrah and the last mushaf that we show you is the very famous and beautiful mushaf called the blue Quran or the blue mushaf written on blue vellum written with gold ink with a lot of effort and a lot of, of, of money was spent on this and this is uh, also from the first century of the Hijrah and this gives us some examples of the earliest mushafs that were written and they are available to this day anybody who wants to compare and compare letter for letter and word for word they can do so the Quran indeed has been preserved from the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam even though the ayat and surah are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala certain aspects the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam also informed us about and of them is where does an ayah begin and end the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam did not sit down and say this surah has this many ayat this is very rare only once in a while. For example, Surah Al-Fatiha, Allah says, this is a verse that is seven. This is a surah that is seven verses. Sab al mathani And uh, for example, in another uh, surah, the Prophet ﷺ said, there is a surah in the Quran composed of 30 verses. And he meant Surah Al-Mulk. So sometimes he told us, but most of the time he didn't. Therefore, how did the later scholars decide where to put the endings of the verse uh, numbers? The response Wherever the Prophet ﷺ stopped regularly, this is what they took to be the ending of a verse. But you see, sometimes he would stop at different places. Sometimes he would run out of breath at one place, and other times he wouldn't run out of breath there. So he would stop occasionally on some verses and occasionally not. And this difference of opinion exists to this day in the Ummah. We find certain recitations of the Qur'an, they have slightly different numberings of verses than other recitations. And we'll talk about recitations in a uh, future episode. But for now, I want you to re realize and remember that the number of verses in the Qur'an depends upon the recitation, called in Arabic the qira'ah that you are reciting. Now the most common qira'ah that people who are living in English speaking lands in western countries, most of the world that follows, it is called the qira'ah of Hafs and Asim. And this qira'ah, qira'ah of Hafs and Asim, it has 6,236 verses in the Qur'an. So 6,236 verses according to the qira'ah that we recite. And the other uh, recitations, and we are, there are 10 total recitations, they have slightly different numbers, between 6,210 uh, all the way up to uh, 6,236. So a difference of 20 or 30 verses, that's it. Now when we say difference of verses, it doesn't mean some qira'at have missing verses. No, not at all. 
The Quran is exactly the same. Word for word, sentence for sentence. The entire Quran is the same between the different recitations. But what is different, one uh, recitation might have split a long verse into two. Another recitation might have taken those two verses, made them into one. So what is different is where the verse begins and ends, but not the actual words within the uh, verses. Also realize that the arrangement of the verses is unanimously agreed upon within a surah. The arrangement of the verses, in other words, when you're reciting the, the Qur'an, you're reciting the verses, it is exactly the same in all of the recitations by unanimous consensus of all the scholars of Islam. There is no opinion of a scholar that this verse should go in Surah Baqarah instead of Ali Imran, or this verse should be in Surah Al-Fil instead of Surah Al-Nas, no such thing. All the scholars of Islam unanimously agree about the arrangement of the verses within a surah. What is this topic that uh, people find so confusing? The topic is that of the various recitations of the Qur'an, the various different ways of how to recite the Qur'an. And when we say the various different ways to recite the Qur'an, we are not talking about different voices or different styles. We're talking about slight differences in pronunciations, slight differences in letters, slight differences in harakat. In other words, if you were to compare two printed Qur'ans, you're going to see differences between them. And this is something that many people are unaware of and many people have heard but are not fully familiar with, especially those who have been exposed to uh, some of our brothers who live in Algeria or Morocco or other North African countries. They recite the Quran in a slightly different way, not just a voice or not just a, a, a speaking style, but also changes in letters and, and, and words and uh, harakat. What is this and where does it all come from? Well, in order to understand that, we need to backtrack a little bit, back to the time of the Prophet ﷺ, and explain that the people at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, for the most part, were illiterate. And... I'm very interested, I'm really finding this video interesting. Uh, if the companions wrote whichever versions of Qurans they had, according to what Muhammad was saying, why why did he have to ask why not ask why did he have to say uh, that he doesn't know where the other Qurans may have come from you know and I mean that's just something we outsiders would just love to know also I'm sure having to preserve something is um, one thing and I love that he gives an example, in fact shows us different um, Qurans and how they've been preserved. That's very, very interesting. But is it just me or did I hear him talk about maybe the terminology may differ one way or another. I mean, it's not a big deal. Of course, things are bound to change. We add more words to our grammar and all those things. I just love how preserved um, it is and um that and they appreciate that and i'm still appreciating that they came together and said you know what let's standardize this this one thing so that everyone can use it although i'd love to ask are there any um other groups out there that use these other, other different versions of the quran that's something i'd love to know so let's get reacting to the last part of this don't forget to give me something to react to i will really really appreciate just comment down below so yeah 